This is episode 383. Hello and welcome to Epicenter. I am Friederike Ernst. I am Mehe Roy. And we're here with uh, Joey Zackel today. Joey is the co-founder of KeeperDAO, um, a um, fascinating new uh, project that describes itself as an on-chain liquidity underwriter for DeFi. And we will explore what that means in a bit. So Joey, welcome to the show. Can you, can you tell us what, what you did before you fell into the Web3 rabbit hole and then we'll take it from there? <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, so I, I have a background as an engineer, and I just generally enjoy building things. Um, my most you know recent projects have all involved some form of automation, um, but I, I got started doing cybersecurity and a lot of low-level programming, and then kind of transitioned more into the, the user interactive space and building mobile apps. But once I got hooked on automation, there's really been no turning back ever since. So I've done uh, automation platforms like IoT, automation platforms for home automation. Um, I've done a lot of video game bots, online poker bots. And then I once I discovered crypto and, and went down the Ethereum rabbit hole, my kind of automation, you know, went in that direction. Um, and, you know, I was most fascinated with the concept of decentralized trade from the Mount Gox incident back in 2014. Um, and I feel like those those events demonstrated the value of, of trustless exchange. Um, and it really inspired me to kind of take my automation skills toward decentralized trade and help facilitate the, the growing need for, you know, trustless asset exchange. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think coming from the automa uh, automation world, uh, it, it's kind of a very seamless transition into Web3. So the the first thing you actually did in the web web three space um, was Volifier, which, as I understand it, is um, a Dex market maker and a smart contract service provider. What drew you to that? So it, you know, it really started as my first step into actually building something in the crypto space. You know, I always liked. Bitcoin, but there really wasn't anything for me to do with it, you know, early on. And so when, when Ethereum came around and these decentralized exchange protocols started popping up, um, I noticed very quickly that they were extremely powerful, but there was just no liquidity. And, you know, I knew I knew enough about trading to be dangerous. So I kind of went down the rabbit hole of, you know, using my automation skills to start building out some components and, you know, started, you know, sharpening my, my trading skills. And, you know, before I knew it, within just a few months, I actually had the first, you know, market maker on Ethereum up and running and it was working really well. Um, and ever since then, I've just been, you know. Um, building out trading integrations, you know, market making, providing liquidity services, um, and you know, on, on one hand, it it's, it it does great well because it you know makes money, but on the other hand, it provides a service and kind of helps um, you know provide that like I guess lifeblood into these systems, you know, because a lot of the early um, protocols didn't have any liquidity and they failed mainly from that, and maybe some of them may have failed because they were hard to use, but but you know, quite a few of them failed because they didn't have any liquidity, and so it's nice to. To kind of provide that liquidity and, and kind of be that trading partner for that first user that comes on board on day one, you know, when they when they trying to find a trading partner and, and there isn't one, you know, you, it's, it's good to have that ready to go. And so I think um, a, a big part of that really is is just about, you know, having um, a, a nice a nice protocol, a, a nice automation platform that can plug into it. So, you know, you need good APIs um, and then you have lots of liquidity requirements too. People want to trade more than just one token, you know, so there's there's kind of a variety of things that go into making that work. And that's um, that's basically how Volifier came about. And today, um, you know, flash, you know, fast forward to. Um, 2021. So a lot has changed. There's a lot of protocols. You know, Volifier has uh, about 10 DEX integrations at the moment, Zero uh, X being the biggest one. So uh, we operate the largest Zero X staking pool. Uh, and it's it's great to see kind of DAOs kind of come back around and, and start, you know, taking their, their place again. Because for a while, you know, DAOs were kind of like a meme and, and people started kind of veering away from them. But now they're starting to kind of come back. And it's it's nice to see that the staking pool, you know, that, that Xerox has created 
um, working and and working well, and it's it's incentivizing market makers to kind of come in and provide a service. You know, whereas back when I started, the only incentive was any profit that you can capture. You know, whereas now there's kind of more mechanisms for you to play with, and it's it's even gotten to the point now where you know there's there's certain cases where you can actually bank on that profit being there, so you can actually potentially trade at break even or even a loss because you know you know there's a staking reward coming, um, and so it's it's nice to see the space evolve um, and. And um, there's obviously a, a lot more in store for Volleyfire in the future, but um, I, I'm kind of even more excited to talk about KeeperDAO, which is what we're here today to speak about. So Volleyfire, uh, you're continuing with the operations and the market makers keep running and KeeperDAO is a different venture that you're pursuing with a different set of co-founders. Yes, that is correct. Um, and what's interesting, though, is they do tend to interact on the blockchain quite frequently. Um, you know, for example, our Keeper bot and Keeper DAO does regularly fill orders that were signed by Volleyfire. So, you know, they're they're totally separate, but they do have a lot of interactions. So, so let's talk about um, Keeper DAO. So, Keeper DAO's self description is that it is an on-chain liquidity underwriter for DeFi. So, there's a lot to unpack there. How would you describe what Keeper DAO does and uh, what its mission is? Sure. So the goal of KeeperDAO is to capture profit opportunities on chain and distribute them to the various participants involved. Um, what's interesting about that is there's there's a lot of participants you know today that actually don't see any of this profit, even though they participate in making it possible. You know, so for example, the participants, we, we could kind of break them down into several categories. We have users, which could just be a DeFi product user. Maybe they're making a trade or a limit order or using a DEX aggregator. Um, you have liquidity providers who are, are staking some liquidity, hoping to gain a yield. Um, you have keepers, which are these traders operating these bots. Um, and then you have, um, you know, for, for us, you know, integration partners, which would be partnering with these various DeFi products. Um, you know, today, when there's profit captured, you know, the majority of it goes typically to one of two places, either the keeper or the miner. Um, you know, and so what we would like to do and, and what we've already begun doing is to kind of redistribute that and also get the user involved and even DeFi products involved. You know, so say if there's a profit opportunity, but maybe this user was responsible for, you know, creating that profit opportunity. Let's make sure to sh let them share in the profit. And so, you know, the first thing that KeeperDAO is is doing is is capturing some of this profit and, and helping to redistribute it. Uh, the second big thing is is coordinating all of these various participants and. There's a lot of factors in coordination here because you could coordinate keepers and liquidity providers and have a you know a flash loan pool, but you could also coordinate users and keepers and and essentially have them kind of collude together to you know share this profit rather than all of it just going to keepers and miners. Um, you could also you know coordinate keepers with other keepers and basically say, hey, you know if you take this one, I'll take that one, or hey, we'll agree to not grim trigger each other. And if we do, we do somehow get out of line, then there'll be a system in place to prevent us from doing that, you know, going forward, something like that. And then the last goal really is to kind of create this entity as a DAO on chain and enable all the participants to govern the system. And that's something that we're we're working towards. You know, it's not a DAO today, but it's something that we're working towards one step at a time. And that should be coming in, you know, soon TM, as everyone likes to say. Maybe just to illustrate, you know, like these... Uh, these roles. So you mentioned a few different roles like users, keepers, miners, maybe some other roles, right? Could you go through a practical example of an either a liquidation or an arbitrage opportunity and just cover uh, these different roles in that particular opportunity and how it works today? Sure. Yeah. So today, it's common for a user to say they submit a transaction to Uniswap directly, or it could be a DEX aggregator that ultimately goes through Uniswap. There are a lot of bots on chain that will use that transaction to extract profit from, and it could be at the expense of the user, or maybe it could be at the expense of something else. Um, but it, in, in one example, 
let's say the user defines a slippage parameter, um, and, and this bot could essentially you know, sandwich attack them in such a way that it pushes their slippage to the max and then they extract profit. And now the user who essentially created this trading opportunity that did not exist before they broadcasted their trade, um, you know, has now been essentially exploited for profit, right? And so, you know, one of the goals is to, you know, if, if the user is going to provide a trading opportunity and profit it results from it, to share that profit directly back from the user. Um, and and another, another simple example would be, you know, let's just say there's arbitrage that's mined into a block. And at any moment, um, you know, somebody could arbitrage Uniswap and SushiSwap. You know, a keeper will make a bid to try to capture that profit. And let's just say there's $100 profit available. The first keeper might bid $20. Um, another keeper might see his transaction in the mempool and bid, you know, $40. And then, you know, a third keeper might come in and see both of them and they might bid $60. And that bid will go all the way up. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it'll go up to near 100%. Um, and, you know, in some cases it'll grim trigger and actually go over hundred percent. In other cases, you know, maybe it'll just get mined in quickly and it'll kind of stay around the, you know, 60, 70% marker. And so there's a, a lot of different types of, of these opportunities out there. And, you know, the, the miners and the keepers tend to capture the majority of that, that value. And in some types of opportunities, most of the value goes to the miners and other types of opportunities, most of the value goes to the actual trader themselves. And it, and it gets, it gets trickier too, when um, something like a liquidation is involved because you have price oracles and there's potential for price oracle manipulation and, and other things there. So there's, there's, you know, a lot of different, um, a lot of different examples, but all of them kind of revolve around, you know, the user getting nothing, even though the user was participating in the system. So um, to kind of look at this from another angle, what KeeperDAO kind of proposes is that um, liquidity providers kind of pool their funds together and then keepers use that uh, liquidity to execute these arbitrage opportunities, whatever the arbitrage opportunity Is, right. So basically, there's is there any constraint other than that it has to be executed within the same block? So today, that is a big constraint. So when we talk about you know using pooled funds for trading, um, as from a keeper's perspective, you know keepers can actually trade with their own funds as well. You know, so if, if we're talking about a small trade that's maybe a couple thousand dollars of, of volume, you know, a keeper may use their own funds in their own smart contract to trade. But if we're talking about a large trade, maybe it's liquidation or maybe it's just a massive arbitrage, you know, the keeper typically is required to flash loan um, in order to facilitate trade for that. Because mo most keepers don't have, you know, millions of dollars in, in a variety of tokens laying around. And that's that's where the flash loan pool comes in and provides a lot of value. Um, you know, today, it is that limitation to where this execution has to happen in, in one block, um, you know, due to, you know, the way flash loans work. Um, we are, you know, thinking through a way for you know keepers to have a reputation and basically say you know okay this keeper can you know perform some sort of action over multiple blocks based on his reputation um but then it, it gets a little tricky because um You know, now it's like, what happens if they don't return the funds or what happens if they just return them late? You know, you need you need kind of need something to slash, whether it's reputation or maybe maybe some staked assets somewhere. But then it gets even trickier because, you know, if, if the keeper has to stake a bunch of assets in order for that reputation, they could have just used that asset instead of flash loaning. You know, so there's a lot of details to work out there and we, we are currently working them out, but we don't have that system in, in place yet. It's something that we're working on for the future. But yeah, as of today, the, the limitation does exist where, you know, the flash has to happen within one block. Okay, so basically what, what KeeperDAO does, it gives the Keeper access to capital, right? And you also talked about something called trim, Grim Triggering uh, earlier. Can we talk about what that is? Sure. Yeah, so a Grim Trigger is, is essentially a, a trading technique where one party 
pushes the trade all the way to break even or even beyond. Um, and so in the earlier example I gave where there was a $100 profit opportunity, you know, for, for one of the traders to grim trigger, they're basically saying I'm willing to spend $100 or maybe even $105 to capture that $100. And they kind of make it, uh, you know, a losing trade for everyone else. So they're, they're essentially signaling to the other traders, um, you know, that, that they, they can't capture this. So grip, grip triggering is is an interesting mechanic because on on one hand you know if we talk about keeper DAO as a trading pool um, that that technique could be used to signal to other traders or potentially even other trading pools that you know it's it's time to work together and coordinate or else there will be no profit um, but you know with all of the different um, you know techniques that are coming out for MEV and arbitrage in general, um, it's it's very clear that there's really no one mechanism that that can succeed, you know, because if you have if you have, you know, traders and miners kind of colluding together in an organized or unorganized way, in certain cases, um, grim triggering won't even be effective because that's kind of you know, sliding under, you know, since if the miner doesn't want to mine in your transaction, they can just ignore it, you know? So there, there are quite a few, um, you know, techniques in play here at the same time. My current imagination of Keeper DAO is, let's say there's, a, there's an opportunity where, you know, um, there's uh, an ETH USDC pool on Uniswap and there's an ETH USDC pool on Sushi Swap, and the prices are slightly diverging. Maybe you can imagine 1800 on one and 1900 dollars per ETH on the other. So, so in theory, if I have USDC, I can go and buy ETH from the cheaper pool and sell ETH to the more expensive pool, and I can get some extra USDC back. There's some profit profit opportunity. So maybe per ETH that you cycle, there's a hundred dollar profit opportunity, but you can cycle hundreds of ETH and you can multiply that profit opportunity as, as big as it gets. Now, um, what Keeper DAO is allowing is that, let's say I'm an independent keeper, a sovereign keeper, then in order to do this, uh, this loop and realize $100 profit, I'm going to need to start with some USDC I own myself. And that's a constraint. So uh, one way to imagine Keeper DAO is, it's a pool of USDC where I can borrow USDC at the beginning of a transaction, I can do this loop, then I can basically return all the USDC and the profit that I make will be split according to some governance logic of the DAO. Yes, that, that's that's correct. And that, that would be essentially one feature of Keeper DAO. That would be just the liquidity pool feature. And yes, we, we have a lot of parameters that you know our team has has set initially and we'll be kind of tweaking over time, but the goal is to have the DAO control all of these parameters. And so just to go back to, you know, the, the different features that we have. So, you know, the liquidity providers providing liquidity into a, a pool that's that's a flash loan pool is essentially just one feature, right? We also, you know, have keepers, you know, that will be coordinating together. We also have essentially the hiding game, which is our mechanism to allow users and keepers to collude together to kind of hide arbitrage to return that back to users. Um, and these things can, can to, in, in some cases, they can work independently of one another. In other cases, they can work all together. You know, so in one example, if somebody wants to just use our flash loan pool to, to flash loan, they can do that for whatever purpose they're doing, whether it's an arbitrage or for some other purpose. Um, but if somebody is, a, say, a keeper wants to use the flash loan pool within the hiding game to work with a user to facilitate the user's trade and also also capture profit, they can do that as well. So these things can kind of be used together or independently. So one way to look at this is by looking at the, compet at the competition between different keepers, right? So basically, by having this grim triggering mechanism that you inevitably have on the blockchain because things are public, you can, you can ensure that you can erase someone else's profit, even if you can't take that profit yourself, but you can make sure that the other person doesn't have it, right? So basically that's in essence what this grim triggering is. Um, you, can't, you can't take it away from someone, but you can make sure that they don't get it. So basically what you kind of need is you kind of need to find a coordination point for the community 
um, basically like a shelling point where people feel like this is this is kind of the most just mechanism or this is the mechanism that we can all that we are all comfortable coordinating with in order to have people not kind of take each other's profits away without actually getting them. So basically who actually gets them is the miner typically, um, who is typically at this level not participating in this game. We'll get to the involvement of the, the, the miner later. So how do you make sure that the keeper DAO is actually the shelling point? How do you make sure that you're the shelling DAO? How do you make sure that you are seen as, as the DAO um, that should govern how these profits are um, distributed between the different stakeholders? Yeah, great question. The Grim Trigger itself is essentially a signal you know, to, to other traders, which they're, they're kind of feeling in the in the profit margin for certain types of trades right for just pure arbitrages you know if if your profit margin is going towards zero you know you're you're essentially getting signaled that it's time for coordination i mean coordination is a, a natural evolution of this this type of trading right i mean people can't grim trigger forever i mean you can't you can't break tr break even and have small losses forever you'll eventually want to coordinate into pools right you know we're we're still um, we're still evolving our our trading strategies that that happen in the wild um, and working towards this, but we're also still monitoring you know some other other strategies that people are implementing, whether it's kind of colluding with miners or or using other other techniques. You know, so it's I I can't really give you an answer today as to you know how you know we're essentially using Grim Trigger as kind of like a, a you know an advertisement for Keeper Dow mainly because at the moment we're actually focused our we're focusing our you know development time and our energy on on the hiding game and kind of transitioning towards a Dow and preparing for the coordination game and our, our actually our first um, implementation of the coordination game will be coordinating the hiding game. We would like to also coordinate trades in the wild. It is it is quite a bit more complex um, because you know as you mentioned it does involve a, a lot of grim triggering and it does involve a lot of um, scenarios where you don't control as much. Like when when you're trading in the hiding game, you control more because you kind of control the ecosystem um, and you, you have the users who are colluding with you. But when you're trading in the wild, um, you know, you don't really control the users and you don't necessarily control the other bots, you know, so it is it is trickier. So, um, you know, grim triggering in the wild is is a lot trickier to handle and implement properly, which is why um, coordinating in the wild is not our number one priority at the moment. But we will work towards that. And who knows, maybe maybe once we are, are kind of happy with with the, the hiding game and we have that kind of coordinating amongst a variety of keepers, we may we may ultimately decide like some other projects have where when it comes time to coordinating in the wild, maybe that does involve coordinating with mining pools. We may get to that point as well. So um, I'm actually trying to understand these two concepts, which is like grim triggering and then the, the other thing is the hide other thing is the hiding game. Grim triggering first, right? So so the problem is something like in the Uniswap sushi swap example, right? Like there's a hundred dollars profit to be made. But imagine a world in which like Keeper DAO was simply like a flash loan pool. The only utility it offered was I could take a flash loan. So in that case, if I'm a keeper, I want to take a flash loan and execute this. Another keeper can also take a flash loan and try to execute the same thing. And these two keepers will end up competing with each other because they want to put higher and higher transaction fees onto their transactions. And the end result of it is that the $100 profit is going to be allocated to a combination of the miner and the flash loan pool. And the keepers will end up making very little, right? So, Essentially, the need for coordination here arises in the sense that if you have two keepers A and B, you want some kind of game to emerge where A and B like decide to collaborate and split up the profits for all such trades in the future. So if there are like a thousand trades to happen, they can collaborate, pay lower transaction fees and split the profits 50-50. So that is the collaboration you're trying to build via, via keeper down, correct? 
Uh, yes, that's correct. So our collaboration mechanism um, between keepers will be, you know, initially introduced in the hiding game because it's much simpler to introduce it there. Introducing it into the wild is very tricky because you can imagine a scenario where you have, say you have five keepers who are, you know, playing by the rules and and behaving properly. You could have five more keepers who are not that are grim triggering the ones who are behaving. So then, you know, you you end up with a gas auction anyways. So it does it does get very tricky when you're talking about something in an uncontrolled environment in the wild when it's Uniswap sushi swap arbitrage. So so then the question becomes, what is this hiding game that you're you're referring to? Sure. Um, so the hiding game is essentially our implementation to where we align incentives between users and keepers. And so the idea is to um, take actions that users like to perform um, that end up resulting in, you know, profit opportunities that get gas auctioned or, you know, get sandwich traded and, and take some of those actions, put them, you know, in, in such a way that the user and the keeper can actually collude together and prevent that gas auction from ever happening or prevent that sandwich trade from ever happening um, and do it in, in such a way that now the user gets some of that profit when profit is captured. So imagine a user wanting to place a limit order instead of making this limit order fillable by anyone in the world, um, because that would lead to a gas auction, make this fillable by only keeper DAO keepers. Now, keeper DAO keepers can look at that and say, okay, it's it's my turn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna capture this one and fill that. Um, and oh, by the way, there was a $100 profit captured. Um, today, we're actually giving all of that profit back to the user um, in, in Rook tokens. And then the the underlying token that was captured goes into the the keeper DAO treasury. Um, you know, in the future, we will take the you know the participants involved and give them each a share based on the percentage that is you know essentially decided by you know governance. Um, so that way, rook holders can determine you know how much how much of that profit should the user keep versus the keeper versus you know maybe the partner because maybe um, a, a dex aggregator or maybe a dex actually was the user in this case or, or facilitated trade for the user because maybe this user didn't go to keeperdow.com maybe this user went to some dex or some dex aggregator and they traded through there and it actually got routed through the hiding game um so, you know so some of that may actually go back to the the DeFi uh project in that case so and the the goal here is to do this um not only for for dex trades but other other common um features that that users use for example let's say they're going to take out a position they're going to borrow you know, some some asset, and they're going to open up a lending position. Um, you know, today, if if a user's position goes underwater and they get liquidated, the user doesn't see any of that profit that gets captured by the bot. But you know, our our goal is to implement a system such that when the user gets liquidated, they actually participate in that that profit capture. You know, they're they're basically you know, and th this gets back to your your question before about the on chain underwriter. And essentially, if if we're acting as the underwriter in this case, we can you know work with the user and say, look. You know, if you open up your position through us directly instead of the protocol directly, um, we will um, share the profit with you and essentially incentivize them to run their positions through us instead of the protocol directly. So if you if you look at this closely, you say, I totally understand where the arbitrage opportunities come from. Say, if I go to Uniswap directly, so basically uh, I'll shift the price and people will want to back run me if I trade on um Limit order uh, DEX, uh, people will want to front run me. If I go to a DEX aggregator, say Matcha, One Inch, or Paraswap, they will kind of they show you the route that they will route your trade. They will kind of use a linear combination out of all of these different sorts of things. And that still opens up the potential for minor extractable value or for basically being back or front run despite the fact that you're going via DEX aggregator, right? So basically my, my, my question is, how does KeeperDAO protocol kind of fit in with this? So basically is KeeperDAO integrated with the DEX aggregators and basically the DEX aggregator will route me via, so basically I go to Paraswap and it will, it will route me via KeeperDAO or how, how, how exactly do I become KeeperDAO's user? KeeperDAO is actually not integrating with 
the DEX aggregators themselves. So um, technically any keeper bot could integrate however they want to. If a keeper bot wanted to integrate with a DEX aggregator, I, I suppose they could. Um, ours natively integrates with each individual protocol probably the same exact way that a DEX aggregator integrates with each native protocol themselves, right? So, you know, if a user, if a user goes to, you know, the hiding game and wants to trade or goes to one of our integration partners and, and opens up a limit order, our bot essentially has its own router that decides what the most optimal route to make that trade would be. And that trade may be through Uniswap or it may be through SushiSwap or it may actually be through another hiding game user as well. So we can essentially match hiding game users with each other, um, which does open up a lot of possibilities there because now essentially you could have market makers who are market making on the hiding game and facilitating trade that way. Um, and then, you know, that would add more liquidity and, and add more value there too. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar to, you know, today we don't show the path to the user like one inch does, which is, which is a great feature. And that's definitely something that we could consider adding and it would be possible too. The, the tricky thing would be, you know, we want to coordinate many keepers to kind of have a, a nice, um, a nice kind of deep layer of redundancy. That way, if say one keeper goes offline for some reason, there's another keeper that can facilitate trade. Or if maybe one keeper doesn't see arbitrage in a certain spot, another keeper does. Go with the one that does see it. You know, certain keepers may have different integrations, right? So the first keeper may have ten integrations, and the second one may only have five, right? So the first keeper may see more opportunities than the second one. Um, so it's nice to kind of have that redundancy. But the tricky thing about that is now, say if you want to show the path to the user we would now need um, you know, a, a, a new line of communication to each keeper where they kind of respond and say, oh, by the way, I'm filling this trade and here's the path. But that would kind of be like after the fact, you know, so it, it would be it would be a great uh, feature idea to kind of have when the user is just first considering a trade, it would be nice to kind of see that path. That, that would be a nice feature. So in the hiding game, what happens in effect is the the routing itself that is currently done in a centralized fashion by the likes of One Inch and Paraswap and Matcha um, is actually itself decentralized. Is that a fair way of putting it? It's done by the keepers, yeah, which which would essentially be decentralized based on how many keepers you have. You know, so today. The hiding game only supports one keeper, which is our internal keeper bot. Um, you know, but you know, soon we would like to start onboarding more keepers, and that that adds a nice layer of decentralization because then you know the community isn't dependent on our keeper bot, which our keeper bot has been you know running and iterated over for many years, which is great. But still, you you kind of don't want to be dependent on just one keeper bot. You want to have many of them with many different integrations, and you know have unique characteristics of each, and maybe some. Are more effective than others and maybe some are less effective than others but that'll kind of work itself out over time okay i see i i think i kind of understand the hiding game now to a certain extent w what does it mean to be an underwriter for the hiding game or on keeper dow the example that i gave earlier about the liquidation is a perfect example of that and so say say a user wants to come in and open up a lending position, maybe they want to borrow an ERC-20 token. Having the user kind of giving that underwriting capability to KeeperDAO um, is advantageous for them. And, and what that would mean is, is the user would open their, their position through our smart contract, and then we would then in turn open that position through the protocol that they chose. And let's say it's Compound, for example. Instead of the user borrowing from Compound directly, they would borrow through us and we would borrow from Compound for them. And the advantage is, um, if there is a liquidation, our keeper will execute that liquidation in such a way that there is no gas auction possible. And then when there's profit captured, assuming that there is, we will share that profit directly back with the user. So the user is actually now, you know, getting a huge advantage here because instead of losing, you know, in some cases that you, you'll you'll read about, you know, someone got liquidated and lost, you know, thousands or millions of dollars. In this case, they they get a good percentage of that back. 
And, you know, initially we, we, we've been setting those parameters to, to give 100% back to the user. And over time, we'll kind of let the DAO decide, you know, oh, so a keeper should get this percent and a user should get this percent. Um, and then in this case too, if there's a partner involved, let's say that user didn't go through KeeperDAO.com. Let's say they, they went through a, a partner's website. You know, we would give that partner some as well. Let me be clear about how I become a user of KeeperDAO. So basically say I, I have um, a maker CDP uh, that is almost underwater. So I open that on oasis.borrow. And how do I make sure that your underwriters are keeping me safe? If you did open that on Oasis, um, then we wouldn't be keeping you safe. What we could do is we could we could have a feature that allows you with you know very minimal clicks and very minimal transactions convert your position from there through KeeperDAO instead. Um, the other alternative is instead of opening it through Oasis, you just open it through us. But um, you know the the feature would be such that um, your position ultimately does go through Compound. Um, you know, it's just kind of routed through our contract where our keeper bots uh, and, and, you know, any, any keeper bot on the network is, is kind of watching for you and, and participating in that for you. And the nice thing about, you know, that redundancy layer is, you know, you're not worried about just one company's one keeper bot protecting that for you. You now have a variety of them all over the world. And what's what's the gas cost incurred by going through your contracts? Because I mean, if you look at the current gas prices, then any contract interaction that can be avoided, but best be avoided, except for really large transactions. So right. what's what's the cost that I incur by going through you guys? So as, as far as the um, the borrowing side, I don't have any gas figures on me at the moment, but it would cost, you know, slightly more gas to open the position through us than it would to open it directly through Compound, for example, mainly because we have to do a little bit of overhead. Um, you know, so if you open it with them directly, that would be the most efficient way to do it. But the good news is this overhead, you know, a little bit of overhead gas cost, um, and it's it's not going to be significant, um, you know, and I, I don't want to quote an exact number, but let's say it's maybe 50k gas cost of, of additional overhead, you know, so that that may increase your gas cost of opening the position by, you know, 10 or, or 20% or something like that. And so I guess the, the probably the, the highest gas cost there would be if you wanted to convert a regular position into a keeper down position, because that would essentially be like kind of um, closing your position and then opening it through KeeperDAO again, which is ultimately opening it through, you know, Compound again. That that one would probably be, you know, a combined kind of like a withdrawal deposit or a, I guess a close open, you know, sort of a mechanism, which would cost some gas. But yeah, it's it's tough when gas prices are high. It's tough to do, you know, say a hundred dollar position when gas is a hundred dollars. That, that's that's hard. Yeah, yeah, I totally see that. So let, let, let's kind of wind back a little bit. So um, let's see, let's say I'm a liquidity provider for KeeperDAO. And what happens to my capital when it's idle, right? There's only ever so much that you could that you can use um, for arbitrage trades, right? That's correct. So when you deposit liquidity, um, you receive a K token, um, which is kind of like your receipt for that liquidity. Um, and the the holder of that K token is essentially receiving a reward for depositing liquidity and putting your liquidity to use. And today you'll you'll earn that reward in Rook tokens. Um, but the pool, the liquidity pool today, is being used for flash loans by keepers to generate profit. We are taking the profit that's captured and, and put into the treasury. Um, and you know today. The treasury is also being used to stake back into KeeperDAO um, to, um, you know, generate a yield for, you know, rook holders who are essentially governing the treasury. Um, and so we have we have plans to use the liquidity pool for a variety of, of yield generation activities. Um, we are just now beginning to to do that and actually implement that. Um, you know, the very first thing we've done with that is to take the the treasury funds, which which are not the the LP funds, but to take the the treasury funds and essentially stake them to to have a, a larger flash loan pool. Um, so in the future, 
for as far as the liquidity pool itself goes, in the future, we would actually like the rook holders to be able to decide what happens there. And I, I actually imagine a dashboard where users can see, you know, here's what's been flash loaned the last week. Um, here's what's been flash loaned last month. And maybe maybe DAI gets flash loaned more than USDC or, or maybe wrapped ether gets flash loaned more than, you know, uh, Ren Bitcoin. And, and so you can decide like, okay, we should put 50% of our, you know, uh, Ren Bitcoin and stake it into this protocol because we'll gain this yield. And, you know, over time, you know, people can make proposals and, and Rook holders can vote and decide on on what's to be done. You know, in the short term, you know, we just kind of you know do a, a a quick kind of you know discussion in the community, and we just kind of make the decisions ourselves. But in the future, the rook holders will be able to make all of those decisions. And I think um, a dashboard will really empower people to get data and say like, what is efficient? Like, how many you know how many ether does does you know keeper now actually need to perform these trades and these liquidations is this too much and and what else can do you know what are the opportunity costs and where can we put that and i think um you know i think we're we're still a little bit away from having this dashboard and all of this information available for users so that's something that that will come with time whenever we kind of you know get get more more fully fledged tools and dashboards out there a lot of the opportunities in the in the DeFi yield farming space are fairly short lived. So I would assume that making these decisions as a DAO is inherently difficult because you don't want to be spammed. So you have like an attention bandwidth problem. Um, but at the same time, you also don't want to give give a small group of people executive control because I mean, that would kind of defy the purpose of the DAO, right? So how do you see this um, playing out? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And these are things that all DAOs are, are trying to work through. So for, from what I've seen, you know, DAOs tend to make, I guess, longer term or what's funny is I guess a long a long term decision in the crypto space is probably a medium term decision. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I guess they're making more medium term decisions at a slower pace. Right. And yeah, I, I agree with you that you can't necessarily just jump on the new protocol that's farming at over 100 percent every other day um, because it's, it's hard to make those decisions quickly. Although um, we actually see a, a good opportunity with, um, you know, our on chain underwriter for the next feature that's coming out for the hiding game as potentially one of those opportunities that that kind of has a, a higher uh, reward um, mechanism to it. So, you know, like today, kind of taking our treasury and, and staking it back in the, the Keeper DAO um, LP pool is one option. But, you know, we may see our, our next pool that that's being launched may, may generate even a higher yield, you know, depending on how well that does. So it's like we may internally, you know, have some good opportunities for that kind of just staking on ourselves. But then, yeah, externally, it's hard because you kind of have to make a, a slower, more methodical decision just you know, from the process of these DAOs and, and voting and, and making sure that, you, you know, you don't want to have votes too often because then, you know, people are just going to kind of start ignoring them, you know, but you want to have them often enough that, that you know, the community is happy with the funds being put to use because you, you definitely don't want idle funds. Nobody likes to see that in DeFi. This is fascinating. So you, you said earlier that the Keeper DAO governance currently is still done mostly in-house by your guys, but you're going to transition to a DAO soon. So what's what's the roadmap on that? So there's a few things that need to fall in place um, first. The roadmap on that is is not clearly defined because we're still kind of working through a few of these, we'll call them like short term challenges. Um, and while some of them are, are presenting themselves more clearly than others, um, you know, we're, we're trying to kind of let the pieces fall. Um, where I think where I think the DAO voting comes into high value in the short term would be um, setting things, setting parameters like where to allocate hiding game profit. And then also, as you mentioned, um, where to allocate um, idle funds, say our flash loan pool is just too large, where to allocate that. I think in the short term, those are those are good values for that, you know, and so we, we what we need to do is we need to transition into, uh, you know, a mechanism that allows, you know, rook holders to make those decisions as opposed to just us internally making those decisions. That's something we're still working out the details for. Um, but I guess the next factor, which is kind of like a slightly, you know, longer term, uh, you know, solution that we're working on would be staking Rook 
two keepers, right? So once we introduce the coordination game and we have multiple keepers coordinating together, um, we essentially want to allow rook holders to determine reputation of keepers because let's say you have let's say you have three keepers um if you allow rook holders to stake their rook on these keepers they could essentially earn rook based on performance of these keepers and so these rook holders would be incentivized to choose wisely and maybe kind of do their own research with the help of all these tools and dashboards that kind of see in to what's going on you know maybe viewing the trades and viewing the profitability and viewing the efficiency of these keepers um, and that's nice because it also kind of encouraged the community to build better tools to, um, you know, look at the efficiency of keepers, engage them. And so say say one keeper may have more integrations than another, but maybe maybe the other keeper also does liquidations, whereas that first keeper only does arbitrage, you know. And so this this will kind of add into it. And, and maybe maybe one keeper, um, you know, just isn't very efficient for whatever reason so that, you know, they, they would potentially be staked less and potentially even lose their turns if they just they, they turn off for a long period of time. Um, and so this will be a nice mechanism, but I also feel like that that may involve, um, you know, some DAO features as well. There may be some dependencies there as well. Cool. So basically all of this, um, the entire incentivization governance is, uh, depends on the Rook token, right? So how was the Rook token distributed? So basically who are the Rook token holders and how do I become one if I want to partake in this? The Rook token economics are based on you know, users participating in the system and, and rook holders participating in the system. Or if you're not a rook holder, you could just become a user and, and essentially start accruing them from your, your behaviors, right? So um, when we initially launched the token, we had a token distribution um, mechanism where um, you could provide liquidity and start accruing Rook, um, and you could also share trading profits with the pool to start uh, accruing Rook as well. Um, and that was that was kind of an initial distribution mechanism that that got the attention of a lot of liquidity providers and, and keepers. Um, and today, you can also accrue Rook by you know, participating in the hiding game as a user. So we, we don't yet have our um, borrowing uh, underwriter feature out yet, but that should be out soon. You know, today we have our DEX trading feature, which allows users to place limit orders. And when arbitrage is captured by executing your limit order, you share in the profit. And so, you know, if, if you wanted to today, you know, you could essentially, you know, buy Rook on a DEX or, or you could just essentially participate, you know, by lending out your, you know, tokens, depositing it to our flash loan pool and you'll, you'll accumulate Rook. And then the other option would be to just make your trades through KeeperDAO.com. And so if you if you launch our app and click on the trade button and let's say you wanted to, you know, just swap wrapped ether for USDC for example, you would, you know, make your limit order, you would set your price, um, set your duration and 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 fire that off and it and it heads to our order book, which is basically orders that are only fillable by keeper dial keepers. And today that is only our keeper and, and once we launch the coordination game that'll be multiple keepers. Um and then, um, you know, once that trade gets executed, if your trade gets arbitraged in any way and generates a profit, that arbitrage, 100% of that goes back to the user um, in Rook tokens. And depending on, you know, how much was, um, how many arbitrages were captured that day and how much that value is, um, most days you'll actually get more value than your arbitrage. So mo most days, let's say if you capture $100 of um, arbitrage through your trade, you may get, say, $110 of Rook tokens back. So uh, one question is, like, in the future, do you imagine the, the software for the keepers as being standardized across all your keepers? Or do you rather imagine your keepers as being as developing their own intellectual property and like hiding the operations of this of their system from other keepers. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually see it going both ways. Um, and so today, I'd say you know probably ninety nine percent of the best traders out there keep their software you know in, in a proprietary fashion where they kind of maintain it and they don't share it with other people. Um, there are you know a few bots floating around, and I've I've heard good things about some people using them. You know, but it's it's hard because um, you know like picturing like purely open source keeper software, it's it's tough because 
it's changing so fast and it's um it requires a pretty high level of you know engineering expertise to kind of build and maintain this um you know so i think the the ones who are most successful at it are kind of so busy just kind of keeping up that they don't quite have time to like put into fully open sourcing it you know the software is very complex um you know so it's kind of hard to you know take something like this and fully open source it it, plus, it's also interesting because there's a lot of different ways to build this software. You know, some some people rely on a lot of third party um, software, whether it's node services, mempool services. You know, it could just be a coin market cap, you know, API, anything like that. Whereas other people uh, try to minimize those APIs and you do as much as possible on their own. And, and other people just actually build their bots, you know, right into node infrastructure rather than kind of having them manage them separately. You know, so there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And I, I actually appreciate that there's a variety of different techniques because that way, you know, like if one API goes offline, all the bots are, aren't just broken now. You know, something like that could potentially be, be a problem. So it is kind of nice to have the redundancy. Of, of different approaches and different strategies. That being said, um, there are a lot of types of trading that would do well in like a standardized piece of software, similar to just downloading a Geth node and running it. Um, and we we do have plans to do something like that, but um, it may not be for Dex trading, at least not anytime soon. Um, we're we're considering doing something like that for our uh, liquidation uh, keeper bot. But we haven't yet decided if, if we're going to, to do that because, you know, obviously if we release a, a keeper bot, you know, a piece of software for, for keepers to use, um, we want to make sure it's done well and it's it's easy to use and it's and it's ready to be released, you know, because keeper bots, they change so often. And it, and it could be mostly because of, you know, front running and, and trading patterns and, and uh, trading strategies, you know, but if if you're talking about like the hiding game, like something that's specific to the hiding game where where front running isn't really an issue, then I think that that's definitely more applicable. You know, so our keeper bot that does DEX trading, you know, it, it was designed to trade in the wild. It trades in both the wild and in the hiding game. So I, I don't think that's a good candidate to open source just because it's way too complicated. You know, but I think a, a bot that specifically targets, say, um, you know, uh, on-chain underwriting for the hiding game, I think that one could potentially be. Um, and and that I, I definitely... I definitely see this this happening at some point in the future. Um, hopefully, it's not the, the distant future. Hopefully, it's sooner rather than later because it it would be nice to you know have people be able to just essentially download a node and run it. And on on that note, though, there may be another opportunity for for people to do that sort of a thing. Maybe you know, like I actually envision um, trading in the future to be kind of more modular because today keepers have to do everything, right? They have to, you know, do node infrastructure. They have to do, you know, front running and, and mempool. Um, they have to write arbitrage algorithms. They have to integrate with all these DEXs. They have to write smart contracts. Like I, I would like to envision, you know, a, a future where all of these things are modular and you could actually just specialize in one part. And maybe you specialize in just writing smart contract in integrations that are incredibly gas efficient. Or, or maybe you specialize in writing software that just purely does, you know, node infrastructure um, or, or maybe you specialize in just purely arbitrage algorithms and then kind of by you know, each component plug these together somehow. And, you know, maybe there's maybe there's an open source piece of software for this and an open source piece of software for that. And and whether this is a node you run or maybe just some component you just download, um, you know, from GitHub. But I, I, I would like to see, you know, a way where where keepers don't have to kind of you know, be a jack of all trades and they could specialize and kind of come together. And, you know, so this this one person who does this one thing really well, he gets rewarded for that one thing. And, you know, now we may be talking like a fraction of a fraction of, of the profit instead of the whole fraction, you know, because uh, say if some percentage goes to keepers, now he may be getting a percentage of that percentage, but still I feel like that that may be a better ecosystem for everybody. Um, and, and I see, you know, um, features like the hiding game, that's going to be much simpler to do than it would be in the wild where you have, you know, gas auctions and front running and, you know, more complexity, you know. So I, I do I do see that becoming possible. It's just a matter of kind of working through the details. But the, I'd say the first step for the coordination game is coordinating different keepers with different bots with different capabilities. And that's actually one of the big challenges with the coordination game is is we want it to be simple enough so that some random person who has a JavaScript bot can 
coordinate with a random person with a Python bot with a random person whose bot is running right in Geth. You know, they all need to kind of work together and it needs to be a very simple protocol that they can all work together, even though they have different integrations and, you know, different features and maybe even different timings. Maybe one bot's more efficient than the other, you know? So assuming that, you know, all these things can come together, we, we, you know, we don't want the coordination game to add too much friction to each individual keeper. You know, it should be, it should be a, a pretty lightweight integration for them to kind of trade through their own smart contracts, but still be a part of, you know, the coordination game. So if you zoom out from here and you look at the coordination game happening between the different keepers and users, the party who truly use, uh, loses here are the miners. Right. So yes, do you right, expect right. resistance on that front? I, I would say yes and no. I would say that. So if for let, let's maybe keep a short term lens on and let's say that the hiding game is incredibly successful because I guess in the very short term um, lens, the hiding game would do exactly what you described. Um, so if, if the popularity just grows massively, and there, there could there could be some you know resistance there. Maybe we could see mining pools not mining a hiding game transaction, for example. And maybe there's some percentage of mining pools that just don't mine hiding game transactions. Or, or they could even you know generalize you know front run it in a generalized fashion and kind of accrue the profits to themselves, right? Because you guys are not you're not a mining pool, right? So you, you don't include transactions in the blockchain. And as soon as you actually broadcast them, anyone could take them and kind of change them a little bit so that they are the beneficiary of that transaction, no? Well, if, if, we're, if we're able to kind of wrap our, um, you know, trades within our one single transaction, like, you know, we, we, and I guess, you know, for the hiding game, we're not submitting multiple transactions, um, and depending on them to be in a certain order, it would just be essentially one single transaction, then that wouldn't be an issue. But, um, I guess if, if like, you know, if, if we were arbitraging a, a hiding game user against Uniswap, um, they could, they could, the miner in theory could manipulate Uniswap to do something so that ours would fail, but it would be easier for them, I think, to just ignore our, our transaction altogether. But then, you know, another mining pool would, would find it. Um, but I guess, so like, if you look at, you know, on-chain underwriting, for example, we would do all of that in one single transaction. So like, say the user was gonna get liquidated and we were gonna share the profit with the user, that all happens in one transaction. So the, the miner couldn't, um, there's not like multiple transactions for them to reorder essentially. But they could still place your order at a convenient location in the block, right? In, in the worst possible location for you in the block. They could, they could, um, you know, but I, I think there's a, there's a lot of cases where that's, that's not a huge issue for us. So let's say the, the way that our, our just-in-time underwriting would work is we would actually liquidate the user just a hair sooner than, you know, getting liquidated elsewhere. Um, but the exchanges is they capture in that, that they share in that profit capture, right? So it's like, if, as long as we're configured correctly, um, the, you, the, any, any public, I guess, any public bot wouldn't be able to liquidate that only our transaction would. So even if they put our transaction as the very last one in the block, you know, as long as we're configured properly, um, we would be the keeper DAO would be the only ones able to execute that liquidation at that point. Okay. So. If I'm a malicious keeper, is there any way I could um, submit a malicious keeper strategy um, and kind of harm users or other keepers or the liquidity providers? I would say there's a way that you could attempt to do it, but I, I don't think it would be very fruitful. And so I'll give you an example. So let's say that we have the coordination game running and there's three keepers, right? So um, we our our system involves you know taking turns and it also involves redundancy. So let's say keeper A has an opportunity and he's up first. It's his turn. So he takes it. It succeeds. Everything's good. Keeper B has the next opportunity. It's his turn. He takes it. He succeeds. Everything's good. Keeper C is the malicious keeper. Now he's up. He's supposed to make a trade, but he decides to not. He just this is you know this is I guess one one way of being malicious is to just not do your job, right? So he decides to not do his job. And, you know, a few seconds will go by and the system, essentially the coordinate, the coordinating system 
the, the users will decide, okay, he's missed his chance. Let's, let's just say that's 15 seconds, for example. He, he had 15 seconds to perform his task and he missed it. So now it goes back to Keeper A again. Since Keeper C didn't do his job within 15 seconds, now Keeper A can now execute that trade. And so the user, the user's experience didn't really get degraded. I mean, I guess his order got filled 15 seconds later, but it still got filled. And also the, the nice thing about since we're using the 0x protocol um, and, it, you know, the, the user signed the price, right? So a keeper can't fill the order at a wrong price because, you know, the signature would be invalid, right? So the, 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 even if a keeper wants to be malicious, if they're filling the order, they're helping the user, right? So the keeper can't really be the, be malicious by filling the order incorrectly. It's like either they fill it or they don't, you know? So from that perspective, um, they, they can't really be malicious. But what a, what a keeper could do to, to attempt to be malicious is they could essentially grim trigger other keepers, right? So let's say it was keeper A's turn, but keeper C out of turn jumped in and tried to take an order and fill it. And then he went as far as taking the profit that was going to be captured and he grim triggered it. So now there's no profit. So what would happen is, you know, the, the coordinating keepers would, would agree that this user is acting out of turn. So he would get punished and he would get his turns reduced, right? So for the user, this is actually okay. The user actually doesn't care because, I, I mean, I guess technically the user does care because so the user's order got filled and that's the goal. The, the first goal is to have the user's order gets filled. I guess technically the user got, got degraded service here because they were probably going to get a reward if the system had behaved correctly, but because there was a grim trigger now, there was no reward. You know, so I guess in this case, you know, the user service got degraded temporarily. But what happens is when a keeper acts out and, the, the you know, the, the coordinating keepers agree that this, this keeper is acting out, um, his, his turns get slashed. So the number of turns he gets, you know, it, like think of his, his share of, of turns gets reduced. And the more he acts out, the more it gets reduced until eventually he's completely kicked out and he, he now can't be a keeper anymore. And so our, our um, reputation system will be such that we want it to be friendly enough to give new and aspiring keepers chances, give them opportunities to prove themselves. But if they get too many strikes in a row, you're out and you, you get your turns reduced to zero and you're booted out. Um, and then if you want to if you want an opportunity again, you know, you have to try again and kind of work your way up. But it's it's going to be one of those things where um you know, if there's a potentially risky keeper or maybe a keeper with zero reputation or negative reputation or something and they want an opportunity, it's like maybe we'll, we'll give them an opportunity some small percentage of the time. Um, but then as soon as they fail, say they fail that 15 second window, we're going to immediately put up a high reputation keeper to kind of make sure that goes through. That way the user's experience isn't degraded. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the worst thing that could happen really is the user's reward gets degraded because there should have been profit, but, you know, a keeper kind of acted out and, and maybe there's even a way we can handle that. Like maybe, maybe we could somehow detect that. And then part of slashing the keeper goes to paying for that reward. Although that mechanism does sound quite complex. That could be possible, I think. So from the point of keeper DAO, what's the worst case scenario? Is it like a keeper DAO too that colludes with a mining pool or is it a keeper DAO too that colludes with um, a client? What to you would be the worst case? Yeah, so I, I think it's actually I think it's actually not not bad if if other say trading pools kind of start popping up because I, I think just as much as as keepers can coordinate with each other i think tr other trading pools can coordinate with each other you know so if there's you know some other keeper dow keeper dow 2.0 that pops up um, even if they claim to be better you know i definitely see a dynamic where pools can can work together and coordinate together you know, and maybe they even have their own hiding game where it's like we have our hiding game where it's only keeper DAO and they have their hiding game where it's only, you know, their their um, their keepers. But then in the wild, I, I definitely see a, a dynamic where where this sort of thing can can happen. Um, but it does get tricky because I, I also feel like in the wild, um, you know, we, we use the, the term collusion, which I think has kind of like a, a negative connotation to it. But at the end of the day, you know, that, that's kind of what it is. But like, uh, you know, working together in collusion, they're kind of similar. Right? So so say it's it's a, a trading pool working together with a mining pool because um, it's you know, it's it, it, it can be very efficient that way. That may that may be what is most successful in the wild is is working together with mining pools you know i guess you could call it colluding but you know not to sound negative because it just may be the most efficient way maybe just kind of re rebrand that to you know coordinating you know traders and mining pools coordinating 
again, I, I could see in the wild, I could see multiple pools working together and I could also see, you know, multiple, um, you know, traders working together with miners. And we, we've actually had discussions with, with some miners and that's definitely one of the interesting dynamics that has popped up in some of our discussions is, you know, it's like if, if one mining pool is working together with this group of traders, what happens when another group of traders come on? Now you have a mining pool. Are they working with two traders or are they kind of married to one trader? And the only way they can, you know, switch to the other one is if, is if they're, they're no longer working with this, this trader. You know, so it's a lot of interesting dynamics coming through here. So if, if you look at the latest in the latest relationship between traders and miners, what comes to mind to me um, is uh, the Tai Chi network that was recently launched by um, Sparkpool, which is kind of a white glove service where you as a user can transmit um, your uh, transaction directly um, to that um, network uh, without publicizing it. And basically Sparkpool will include it in the next block that they mine. Basically, it, it, it shields you from being front run or back run or basically if you have any sort of exploit, it shields you from, from being generally front run. So where do you see this trend going? Because I mean, if, if, you, look at, if you look at this and if you actually think this further, what will happen is you will have a small number or you will have some number of trusted Ethereum endpoints to whom you would give your transaction to be mined without ever publicizing it directly. And this would increase the barrier to entry for any other miner immeasurably, right? Because there'd be no free, there'd be no transactions in the mempool, so to speak. So how do you see this playing out? Do you think the MEV issue is going to be what breaks the decentralization of Ethereum? Or do you think basically we'll end up in a state where we will divide the right from mining the block from the right to ordering tr the transactions within that block? Or how do you think this is going to, to play out? It's, it's really hard to see one particular feature or strategy succeeding. I, I think we'll ultimately have a, lo a lot It'll just be a combination of you know features or strategy succeeding together, and and it could be it could just kind of go back to you know the the roots of mining pools, you know, and and how they're essentially independent from one another. You know, you may have some mining pools use this solution and this strategy, other mining pools use this solution and this strategy, and maybe certain mining pools you know, kind of uh, work together to capture MEV in this way and other ones do it a different way. Um, but generally, I, I really like the, the Tai Chi network and, and what, what they're doing there. Today, you know, in its current form today, it works great when you don't necessarily need a transaction to get mined into the very next block or the next two or three blocks, just because you're kind of limited on hash rate there. That's the only downside. So like maybe one evolution here that, that I would love to see would be, a, say, a similar Tai Chi network for every single mining pool. Like I mean, even having this feature kind of standard within node infrastructure would be nice because then you know, no matter which you know miner you're, you're speaking to, you know, you you could have this level of privacy. But it's like technically the mining pool can do whatever they want. So, you know, not all of them might go for that. You know, maybe only some fraction of them would go for that. So we, we may only see a fraction of the hash rate have this sort of private solution. And then I guess the other problem too is, I mean, what's to stopping a mine, what's stopping a mining pool from claiming that it's private when they're still just front running it anyway, you know? So it's kind of like, it's tricky. Like I, I, I do, I do, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, nodes and, and mining pools are kind of, able to kind of have the flexi flexibility to do it their own way. I mean, that's kind of what makes it decentralized. It, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can get to a point to where either say something like a, a Tai Chi network, the hash power of that feature grows dramatically. Like even if, if you could say like have like, you know, 70 or 80% of, of the network has some sort of a trusted solution, um, then you just need to, when you're broadcasting your, your private transaction, you just send it to 80% of the, the network and, you know, the other 20%, you just say, well, if they mine the next block, oh, well, you know, th that, that would be kind of nice. But, um, yeah, I, I, as far as like all of these solutions in general go, I, I kind of see them finding a way to, co to coexist. I think multiple solutions will probably win in the end and we'll just be using multiple solutions in the future. Um, it's, it's hard to say if, if any one particular one will trump everything else. It's, it's tricky because, you know, if you look at, you know, 
you know, these profit opportunities today, I mean, they're, they're going to be changing so much over the next few years, and they really have over the last few years. And with Layer 2 solutions coming on board and ETH2 coming on board, I mean, there's just, it's, I think it's going to get even more complex than it already is. It, like, unfortunately, I don't really see it being completely solved. I think it just becomes more complex, especially with all these different Layer 2s. And, you know, you'll have people arbitraging between various Layer 2s, between Layer 1 and Layer 2, uh, you know, between other blockchains and in Ethereum, and so I, I unfortunately I don't really see it getting any simpler or any you know more complete. It might just grow more complex, but maybe we have you know decent solutions where you know a user can just simply make a trade to to Uniswap in a private fashion without having to go through all these other steps. And, and like I said, maybe, maybe it's just as simple as maybe instead of just one Tai Chi network, we have, you know, some good percentage of hash rate and they can say, you know what? I don't care if my transaction gets mined in the next block, because if I've got 50% hash rate, hopefully it'll be mined in within the next two and they'll be fine. You know, so something like that, hopefully will pan out. So you don't think MEV is going to break Ethereum? I like some of the solutions and, and, and proposals that have been coming out. I don't necessarily think it's going to break it because I think it's just kind of a part of having a decentralized network with assets being traded. I mean, it's it's kind of natural. I don't necessarily think it's going to kill it because I, hopefully, hopefully we can kind of stay ahead of the... Uh, cat and mouse game, and it doesn't kind of bring it to a screeching halt. You know, like, for example, um, you know, the, the first in, first out upgrade that was made uh, helped prevent a lot of the, um, you know, tailgating strategies from spamming the networks. Um, that was, that was I think, last year. And then, you know, some, some of the solutions, like, proposed to kind of, I guess, eliminate the, the gas token, so to speak, is kind of helpful too, because that kind of prevents that. And if we can, if we can kind of, kind of work towards it and then also just kind of implement solutions to kind of help, you know, streamline this process to, to, to capture the value and distribute it, you know, to, to, to parties involved. I think that's good. I don't necessarily think MEV is going to bring Ethereum down to its knees and, and completely, you know, destroy it. No. Do you think um, commit and reveal schemes where basically you commit a an encrypted order or something, and then basically it's committed and then you have to reveal it later. Do you, do you think that's going to alleviate the problem to a certain extent? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I've really studied that enough to kind of offer an opinion on it, but it's possible. Um, I, I also wonder, like, I don't know how efficient that is. Do you have an example? Because I'm, I'm curious about the, the efficiency of that in terms of, you know, I guess from a trader's perspective. I mean, there's different ways you could do it, right? So basically you could encrypt a trade with, um, say, three different, I mean, basically there, there are these distributed key generation things where, where you, can, you can encrypt with a number of keys and you can decrypt with any number of, any subset of a number of these private keys, right? So basically you could have these schemes where you encrypt your order and it gets committed and then basically there, there are these uh, revealers and a subset of these revealers need to decode it in order for it to become a valid order on the blockchain. Um, so you can't basically, no single revealer can kind of block it and it's kind of out of your hands. All of these cryptographic solutions are typically fairly gas intensive. That's, so that's what I was going to wonder is like, I wonder, you know, it sounds like it may actually involve multiple transactions and then it may also be gas intensive, which is, but it's, it's, you know, it, it may be, it, yeah, it may be effective because if you're, if you're dealing with like a massive, massive arbitrage, you know, what's a million gas, you know, what does that matter? But I guess if, if you're pushing thin profit margins, it may not work. But, but again, if, you know, if you're, if you're looking to capture a million dollars, then spending a million gas at 200 G way doesn't really mean anything. So it, it may very well be, yeah, I'll, I'll have to do some more research on it. I continue to be fascinated by how even putting together fairly basic elements of, you know, the trading, uh, the trading world kind of results in such enormously complex games where, where you can include and collaborate and kind of grieve someone else and so, so on. I think it's, it's endlessly fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm super curious to see how it plays out over, say, the next year or two. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's super good to have you on, Joey. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really enjoy this. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. 
you can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.